I'm also going to start my presentation. All right. I do hear somebody's TV in the background, so if somebody can get that um, microphone muted, that would be great. Uh, so again, I'm Ken Rosenthal. I'm a uh, Park National Center Golf Branch Nature Center, and growing up as a child, I was terrified of spiders. Um, I don't know where it came from or why, um, and I feel like I really missed out on some interesting stuff as a kid um, because spiders are actually pretty fantastic and a pretty amazing group and the things they can do. I, I can sympathize with anybody that is not um, fully on board with the beauty of spiders. I, I, I get it. and. Um, I've done programs on that too and talking about arachnophobia, um, but I'm going to try to focus um, really on, on spiders and um, uh, how neat they are and, and there's a lot of uh, diversity within the group as well. Um, so let's let, let's get right down to brass tacks. If you've done this with me before, uh, welcome back. If you haven't and you're new, uh, I like to establish where we are uh, in the tree of life or at least within the animal kingdom uh, when I do this. So what is a spider? It's an animal. I think we can all agree on that. They do not have a backbone, uh, so they are an invertebrate. Um, they do have a jointed appendages and an exoskeleton, so they are an arthropod. Um, they have uh, more than six legs, so they are not a, a insect. And they're an arachnid, which also eliminates the crustaceans. Um, the bottom right here, this is a tick, and up here, this is a daddy long legs or a harvestman. Um, and they are not spiders. Uh, spiders are in the order Araneae, uh, and I'll talk more about the, the daddy long leg later. So, like all arth arthropods, as I mentioned before, uh, spiders have jointed appendages and they have an exoskeleton. The nice thing about an exoskeleton is that it protects you, uh, it gives your body form, it provides color, uh, it can do a lot of neat things. What it can't do is grow with you. I think if, if I always like to tell people, you know, when you when you have growing pains when you're growing up or when you if you remember what, you know, growing pains were like, that's part of that is your skeleton growing and you have those little aches and pains. Uh, arthropods don't have that when it's time to get bigger. They begin to grow second exoskeleton underneath the first. They then have to emerge from the exoskeleton, their current exoskeleton uh, and then give their new one chance to uh, essentially take its form, get a little bit bigger, and then harden. Um, so it can be a very dangerous process. And depending on how long it takes them to molt, and depending on how long it takes their exoskeleton then to harden properly, um, that is a um, that can be a pretty long time where you're vulnerable. So they often hide um, somewhere where they feel fairly safe in order to uh, undergo this process. Um, this is uh, one of our fishing spiders, and the nice thing about that's my hand underneath. And the nice thing about it is, their exuviae is, um, and the exuviae is what you call the uh, molted exoskeleton. The exuviae is, is pretty nice, but this is something that um, we have a lot of because they really like our cabin behind the, the, the pond. And you can take these, um, and we have like a little, literally have like a little container of like 15 or 20 of these. And this is something you can hand out to a group of kids and talk about spider uh, anatomy, and they can see it with the naked eye or with the help of a, a small magnifier. And Oh, they're not going to get bit. They're not going to be, hopefully, you know, they might still be a little creeped out, but hopefully not too creeped out. Whoops, because it is a, you know, it's not alive anymore. It's the old uh, spider exoskeleton. So if I get my, my, um, my cursor out here, you can see the mouth parts here, and I'll talk more about that. Each of these holes are where the legs came out of. Um, some spiders can regenerate legs. If they lose a leg, um, they will regenerate a leg during their next molt. I think uh, I know some tarantulas can do that. Um, if you look here, this was the top. This was the carapace, which was the top of this body part here. And you can see the holes where the eyes were um, positioned behind there. So I think that's it's always my favorite part of looking at these. And this would actually fold up and go back onto the top of the spider here. So let's see what those parts are. Uh, tagmata is a fancy name for a grouping of body segments. Even though we talk about the head, the thorax, and the abdomen with insects, if you look at them, you notice there's segments. Like on this dragonfly, you can see there's several segments on uh, dragonflies. And these segments and their color patterning can be diagnostic in identifying dragonflies and, and damselflies. And then here is a, a large uh, differential grasshopper. Uh, and in addition to all the other anatomy, I, I was so happy when this guy landed on the, um, 
the window so I could take pictures of it. Uh, you can see that the that even though this is the thorax and this is the uh, abdomen, you can see the different segments that make up these body regions. Um, so that's where the, the term tagmata comes from. And then obviously this is the head. So if we look at our spiders, this is a large um, species of hogna this is the genus name. Um, this is something I saw out in Colorado, but it's a nice it's a nice picture I like to use. Um, you would not find uh, this species around here. Um, we can see the the two tagmata. So I think w one of the things that um, I always think about, we always learn about insects. And and I think, you know, you grab a, a kid in grade school and they can tell you six legs, three body parts, that's an insect. So um, spiders only have two body parts. They have an epistosoma uh, or the abdomen, and then the head and the thorax are fused into a cephalothorax or prosoma. Um, and I think these opistosoma and prosoma are newer um, terms that are um, being used more accurately. But, you know, I grew up learning cephalothorax and abdomen as, as the two names. Uh, and as I mentioned, and I think most people know, spiders also have eight legs. Um, the important thing to recognize is that it looks like there's 10 appendages, but only eight of those are legs. Those eight legs are what they use for um, uh, locomotion, getting around, climbing, those kinds of things. These two little guys in the front of the head, these are called pedipalps. Uh, they're sensory organs. They can help them taste. They can help them smell. With males, they also help them deliver sperm. This is an important um, piece for mating because the males will um, use these to transfer sperm. And you'll see how that can be really dicey if you're a male spider uh, a little later on. Um, so uh, since you're all muted up, I won't get an answer from this, but hopefully all of you are shaking your heads know that this is not a spider. It does have eight legs. It does have eight um, jointed appendages, but it does not have two main body parts. It's only got one. This is a um, harvestman. Uh, I grew up calling them daddy long legs. Uh, also, uh, opiliones is the name of the, uh, is the classification or the name of the group as well. Uh, and these are really common and they are arachnids. They're just not um, a proper spider uh, by classification. Um, and then hopefully, again, can't ask you guys, uh, it's not easy to ask you guys, but hopefully you'll notice that there are two critters here and they look very similar, but they're very different. Which one is the ant? Which one? This guy over here. This is the ant. One, two, three body parts, two antennae, six legs. These right here are not antennae. Those are actually the front legs of the spider, the front pair. And these are pedipalps that it's got that are modified so that this critter looks like an ant. And there are um, whole families of, of species of ant mimicking spiders, and they can um, fool ants. They can steal food from them. They can eat the ants. Um, some of them will even go inside ant colonies because they have the um, pheromones or chemicals that can properly mix the uh, the signals that the ants release. Uh, so there, it's really a, it's a fascinating um, adaptation, and it's an, an amazing way of fooling them. Because again, I, I think if you saw this guy with a bunch of these. Uh, if you saw this spider with a bunch of these ants, uh, it'd be very hard to pick that out unless you knew what to be looking for. I, I've seen ant mimicking spiders before, and, and I had to do a double take, and I'm sure I've probably missed many. Uh, and they're really neat um, uh, uh, adaptation uh, for them to to make a, essentially an, an entire lifestyle out of. Uh, most spiders have eight eyes. This is a nice... Um, kind of compilation of many different spiders. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, not all of them have eight eyes. Um, some have zero. Uh, I've seen two and four. I don't know if there's any with six, um, but most of them have eight. So eight legs, eight eyes. Uh, and again, you can see these uh, eyes are in different formations. You get two large ones, four small ones. There's lateral ones on the side. Um, let's see where else we got here. Here's a couple of tiny ones. I don't know where the rest are. Maybe they're right there. Um, this guy has got two right here and a couple here. So they're very, they can be very different. A lot of these are, are jumping spiders. And you can see these jumping spiders have these large front facing eyes here. It's because they're hunters. They're predators. They're all predators, but they're hunters. Uh, and so they need those forward facing eyes to find their food. Um, this is a nice little, um, diagram of spider eye arrangement in the terminology you can find this on bug guide there's a nice article all about uh, spider eye arrangement uh, and i'll tell you why in a second uh, but these four in the middle 
this four pack here, if you will, are the median eyes, the green ones are lateral eyes, and then the top row you call the posterior, and the bottom row you call the anterior. Um, so, you know, if you want to be real specific, the, you could talk about the lateral anterior eyes, which would be these two outer eyes on the bottom, the posterior uh, medium eyes, which would be the two outside eyes on the top here. Um, or I'm sorry, the posterior medium would be the two inner eyes uh, on the top here. Um, so this looks pretty generic, and it is, uh, but when you look at the different eye arrangements from different spiders, you can see there's very different ones. Now, when you look at somebody like this, look at this spider right here, um, these are definitely um, spiders that hunt. You get these two big eyes in the front, another one right here, these two big eyes. And those eyes are to help that spider hunt. So these are very likely not going to be spiders that uh, build a web. Um, I feel like one of the first things we learn, we learn about honeybees, which are non-native, uh, and they're colonial insects, and that's very um, different from the majority of insects. And the other thing we learn about is spiders, and spiders build webs. And I feel like, if I remember the numbers correctly, less than half of spiders' species actually build webs. Now, they all can make silk, and we'll talk about that later, um, but they don't all build webs to trap their food. Um, but the reason I want to talk about eye arrangement is because, as it, as I wrote here, it can help in the identification of spiders. Sometimes it can get you to family. Sometimes it can get you down to genus, uh, and that could be really helpful in identifying the spider you have um, if you were willing to get that close to uh, check out that spider. Um, see again here salticity this is a family name these are the jumping spiders and again you see the two really large eyes here and if, i'm trying to remember a uh, red eye is not visible from the front um in some species so these are these can be really tough to see and you can see they're very tiny mishumessa species here this guy here these are the crab spiders the ones you see hiding in uh flowers uh, and they are also not web uh web spinners um, and they have um, four very similar size eyes in the front, uh, and that gives them a bigger uh, view around them because they're lying in wait and they're ambush pairs, so they don't want to miss movement on, on the sides or in front of them. And so this eye arrangement helps them to find the food they're looking for. And then Hogna, this is the big spider I showed you uh, earlier that I did the terminology on, those big eyes. This is a hunter, uh, very much these two front-facing eyes. Uh, that are big and they're there looking for um, food. One of my favorite tricks, um, I'm assuming you all can see me, but if you can, I'll do it again when there's a question time. Here, I'll use my, my bottle of soda. I like to take a flashlight, imagine this is a flashlight, the light here, put it next to my eyes and then scan to look for eye shine. The Hogna um, species here, this is a, a species of wolf spider. Wolf spiders have these big front facing eyes. They are nocturnal and so the eyes will um, reflect. And so you can take that flashlight, hold it next to your eye and scan the woods in the dark. And sometimes on the underside of logs, uh, the sides of rocks, you know, at the base of trees at different places, you'll see these two little glints shine back, this little eye, this little eye shine and that spider eye shine. Um, I got to go to Costa Rica in January and I tried that on one of the hills and nearly had a, uh, a coronary because um, I shined the light. You know, I had a headlamp on it, turn it on, and the whole hillside glittered back at me. And that was way too many spiders even for me. Uh, I got over it quick, but it was really amazing how many, how many spiders there were inactive. And again, it's the tropics. Um, so yeah, these are this eye shine is something really fun to look for and these front ones I probably could do it maybe with um, jumping spiders too but I know for sure that a lot of these wolf spiders will hunt at night and again they're not big predators as big as they might feel to us and so they've also got to hide so the cover of darkness is a good time to hide it's also a time when uh, some of your food might be out I know I might be talking a little fast and if I am I apologize but there is a lot uh, of things to go through spiders is a pretty big topic this is what I get asked the most about, is biting. This is the big concern when people start talking about uh, spiders. They always have questions about this. So let's do a, um, a quick terminology here. These right here are chelicerae. These are the jaws. And at the end of the jaws are the fangs. And typically in spiders, this is where the venom travels from the venom glands uh, through tubes here to get into the fangs uh, and then obviously be injected into the prey. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is a jumping spider. You can see on this jumping spider, this really beautiful green metallic color here. 
this color is also thought to be used. Excuse me. This color is also thought to be used as a display as part of its display for mating and attracting a mate. So my guess is this is probably a male. And again, to reinforce the eyes, look at those big, two big front facing eyes right there looking right at the camera. Uh, this is definitely a, a sight predator. Um, so here are two different types of, and spiders are classified as two different types of um, jaws here. Um, you've got the Iranian morphia, uh, which are the typical spiders we'll find around here. Megalomorphia are the ones uh, that includes like tarantulas, so you don't see a lot of these around here. But what these two words describe is the way that their jaws work. So you've got Arani morphia, which have two sideways fangs, so they pinch together. Okay, so they pinch like this. Whereas the megalomorphia, they have downward facing fangs, so when they come out, they stab down. So they have, you have um, the spiders you find around here, which do the side pinching, and then the spiders that are more like tarantulas, which don't have a lot around here. Um, and trapdoor spiders, I think, are also in that group. Uh, and I don't feel like we have a ton of those around here. We might have a, a couple species, but they have fangs that stab down. Um, and so that's the difference between these two. So you can see these two very uh, different fang structures. But again, their fangs are both at the end of the chilis array, uh, and they contain the uh, they're they are transporting venom from the venom glands to the um, uh, to the fangs to be injected in the prey. All right, let's move on here. So these are the questions I always get asked. Um, is the spider venomous or dangerous or does it bite? Um, I always, I get asked this, I always answer the same way. It's always the same information, regardless of how the question is phrased, because I feel it's important to, to make these distinctions. Um, so I'm, I'm probably going to read these slides, slides a little bit, but I want to make sure I, I get this point across. So I always say first, yeah, the spider can bite. That's how they get their food. You know, um, there are, I would say, the vast majority of, of uh, living creatures that are, that are animals have some way of biting because that's how they consume their food. Not all of them, but, but most of them. Um, and, and spiders are no different. They all have fangs. They all... Um, and I'll get to the next part there, but they all fang and they're going to bite. So the question really isn't, can they bite? Because they can bite and that's how they get their food. The question is, are they going to bite? And can they can they bite you? You know, is it significant? Um, will they bite is, have you, are you grabbing a spider? Or are you handling it roughly? Uh, is it, you know, did you stick your hand somewhere where you couldn't see what was going? There's a spider under there and the spider feels trapped. Um, one of my all-time favorite far side uh, cartoons, I think it was actually scorpions and not spiders, but they're sitting on a boot. And one of them's like, it was horrible. This five-headed thing attacked me. And you see someone's feet off to the left and you can tell they were stung by that scorpion. Um, this is very much true. In certain areas, there are, whoops, there are spiders that, um, you know, like to live in areas underneath rock, underneath um, leaves and sticks or logs. They like to, un um, uh, they'll, they'll even live in like messy areas. So if you've got like a shed or a, you know a messy room or something like that, sometimes spiders get in there. You know, uh, if you're in an area, uh, and maybe not so much where people live, but if you've got like uh, you know a room like an attic or something you don't use much, or a shed, a mud room, and it's a little messy, you don't want to go sticking your fingers under there. If you're in an area that has black widows, if it's an area that has brown recluses, um, so, and I always like to point out to people too. You know, if you're watching a lot of uh, if you're watching a lot of action movies, um, it seems like our skin is not very tough at all. Um, but our skin is our skin is very tough. It can resist a lot of things. That's why um, bees, which can sting insects, uh, which can sting birds, can, they can retract their their stinger. They can't from our skin because it's actually very tough, and the hooks and barbs in their stinger get stuck in our skin, and that's why they end up injuring themselves mortally uh, because of that. Um, spiders are no different. A small spider like this crab spider might not be able to give you a, a good bite. I'm trying to remember exactly how big that spider is, but I don't think it was big enough to, uh, to give you a decent bite. It might pinch you, but I don't think it could really pierce your skin. On the other hand, this is a fishing spider. It's a pretty large spider. It could probably give you a pretty good bite, uh, and it's going to hurt. Um, obviously, it's going to hurt because 
the fangs are piercing your skin. But the other, the other reason that it's going to hurt is because spiders are dun, 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 venomous. All spiders are venomous. This is how they help. This is how they, they catch their prey. It is also often how they digest their prey. Spiders do a lot of external digestion. They um, bite their prey, inject the venom, which subdues their prey, but then they also uh, liquefy that prey and then they slurp it up. And I know that might sound gross to some people, but that's an important part of eating as a spider. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the question really is, when it all comes down to this, it really comes down to the, my fourth Piece, I know I'm taking a long time to answer this question, and some people I, I'm sure check out after like five seconds. But the, the piece that people really want to know is, can I get sick? Can I get um, really hurt from the spider bite? Around here in Northern Virginia, probably the only spider that is medically serious, and that's the key question, that's what they really want to know, is the, uh, the black widow. Uh, there's actually, I think, four species of black widow in North America. Latrodectus is the genus and I'm going to come back to that later with another spider that's not from around here. So the black widow is medically serious. I don't think it's typically fatal unless you actually have a severe reaction to the venom. It's not a cakewalk. You're going to feel miserable. You're probably going to get cramps and it's going to be very uncomfortable, but it's something that you know, I think most healthy adults can survive, uh, but you still want to seek medical attention for it. So that's, I think, where these questions really come down to is people want to know if that, if a, if that spider is able to bite you, can it make you really, really sick? And for the most part around here, no. Now, if you, um, you know, a big spider can give you a painful bite. Uh, if the venom reacts, if you have a little reaction to it, it can be itchy or, you know, raised or swollen a little bit more so than maybe some other people with the same kind of bite. So it depends on how you react to that venom. Most of these spiders have a venom that is all about subduing their prey. And their prey very often is uh, insects, is uh, invertebrates, maybe small vertebrates, and it's not a, a venom that's typically going to react much for us because it's not, evolution hasn't selected for that venom to be a, something that's going to hurt a vertebrate. It's it's very much more for invertebrates. Some wasps out there that um, sting, don't sting, you know, they'll sting and it doesn't hurt nearly as much as some others, and it's because we don't have a reaction to that venom because there's different types of venom. So those venoms aren't designed to subdue us because the spider's not going to eat us. And also the um, the venom is not in a, a big dose. And certainly there are spiders in other parts of the world that have much more medically serious venom. It's really, really something that you don't want to mess with too much. Uh, but around here, black widow is pretty much it. And I always tell people, if you're not sure what a black widow is, they are... They got these long legs. They have this black, shiny body. Uh, sometimes you'll see those red spots on the back, like on the left. Those are the younger ones. Um, you might not always see the um, double hourglass underneath. I, I'm sorry, the hourglass or double triangle underneath. Sometimes the two triangles don't actually meet, so there's a space between them. Um, and if you're not sure, if you see a hairless black spider, don't touch it. That's that's what I always tell people. If you're not sure about a spider or a snake, don't touch them. Um, so I want to move on to the, the one except there's always exceptions. Nature is, uh, you know, we do these classifications and it's very much a human made system to understand nature. And that means that sometimes there are exceptions. Uh, this little guy is one of them. This is a jumping spider, Bagheera Kiplingi. And if those names sound familiar, Bagheera is the, um, the Black Panther from uh, Rudyard Kipling's uh, jungle tales and obviously kipling eye is a, is a direct uh name to the author um the, the the group that named this they've used other the scientists that named the spider have used these names and uh, naming some other spiders they discovered as well but what's really neat about this insect uh, excuse me what's really neat about this jumping spider is it lives on acacia trees and in mexico it's in costa rica it's in mexico uh, more so in Mexico than Costa Rica, the, the two populations have slightly different uh, habit, um, habits. Um, the ones in Mexico spend a lot of time going on, hopefully you can see my arrow here, you can see these little nubs. And they actually spend a lot of time feeding on these nubs. What's interesting about 
acacia trees and what they often get studied for is because there's a lot of ants that have co-evolved with acacia trees so you see it's a really big thorn here and in some species the thorns are hollow the ants will use these thorns as protection they'll live in thorns um excuse me they will come out and feed on these nubs as well and then anything and i mean anything that lands on the tree caterpillars insects um small vertebrates they will come out and bite uh humans you know they will defend the tree vigorously against anything they see as a threat to it um and so th it's this great mutualistic coevolution where the ants protect the tree the tree offers shelters to the ants uh and they're all happy well these little spiders can be found on these trees in in mexico and in some areas in uh Central America, like Costa Rica, and what they will do is they will actually eat these nubs too. And it's, I, I hate to say the only one because I'm sure there be, might be one or two you can find, but I feel like it's the only one that has a primarily herbivorous diet, meaning it eats mostly plant material. Uh, and most spiders do not. Uh, most spiders do not do that. Um, they are all about hunting predators, eating uh, meat and other animals. That's what they do. So. The spider was a real big find. What they found, what happened was, it was a grad student who discovered the spider and its peculiar habits. Because most of the time, if you're studying acacia trees, you're studying ants. That's what you do, because that's what's really interesting about them. And so, um, these guys hide on these trees. They avoid the ants all the while grabbing these little nubs off the tree. Now, occasionally they don't avoid the ants. They'll steal ant larvae and eat them. They will, oh, what else? Will they, sometimes I think they'll even eat the ants, but they'll steal food from the ants as well. But generally they spend a lot of time avoiding the ants because the ants will attack them because they're on the acacia tree, which is not what the ants want. Um, so this really fascinating little spider that is, goes against some of the norms I just talked about, which is, you know, they eat, uh, other animals and that's what they use that's what they use their venom to to hide or to uh, hunt with so um one thing about spiders they're always hairy i think this is one of the things that sometimes um people get creeped out by this is a, a fishing spider and they use hairs can sense vibrations and they can touch um and they're certainly going to help the spider sense any vibrations in the water and that's what it's sitting there waiting for with its feet in is to see if there's any disturbances in the surface or anything moving that it would like to go after some spiders have hairs that can help them with different things. This is obviously not one of our local species, um, but this tarantula has urticating hairs. And what that means is it can actually fling the hairs off its body. They can be very irritating uh, to the skin. Um, you certainly don't want to get them in your eye or in your mouth because they can, they can really stick in and they're not a lot of fun. Um, and I've seen working with a, a spider like this, I've seen them do that before where they get agitated and they just start flinging the hairs. Um, you don't want to get those uh, in your skin. Some of them, some species can have urticating hairs, which are very irritating and, and uh, even painful. Speaking of hairs, this is a, an electron micrograph of a spider's foot. Uh, evolutionarily speaking, they used to have, um, let me use my point, I'm pointing at the screen. Uh, they used to have two claws facing forward and one claw backward so you have three claws in a pincher, almost like this, okay? And they've lost many species. Most species have lost that third pincher and instead have this now this, um, all of these hairs around their feet. And what a lot of these hairs do is they, they employ something called Van der Waals force, V-A-N-D-E-R-W-A-A-L-S. It's named after the, I think it's a Dutch physicist that discovered this force and it's a force that um tries to keep molecules together when there's a very small space between them so having feet like this with these two claws but also these hair it's almost like having uh, a little bit of suction that it can help hold it to the wall so this is how spiders can climb up the sides of walls they can go up glass they can go across ceilings um geckos use something it was thought that geckos used something similar, but I feel like there's more of a capillary action with their feet, although they do have a lot of these filaments as well. But this is definitely true for uh, spiders. Apparently, recently on social media, maybe not recently, but within the last couple of years, there was a lot of people posting um, spider paws, which was the hairy feet of their tarantulas. And you can see how they've got a lot of hair on them, and that can certainly help with this as well. 
So this is a, um, a jumping spider, and some Swiss and German scientists calculated that this spider had, with its eight feet, had about 600,000 setules, or those little hairs, all around, all over its feet. So when it climbed, it could, um, the adhesive force that those 600,000 setules produced would allow the spider to carry something that was 173 times its weight. Um, so if you've ever seen video or pictures of like these small spiders carrying like a toad or a small vertebrate up a wall or across a ceiling, that's how they do it. And the bigger the spider, the more of these sequels of hair they have because they're a bigger spider and there's more weight and they need that in order to cling to surfaces. And again, there's those big eyes from that um, uh, jumping spider. And you know, sometimes you see the fangs, but these are actually the pedipalps kind of covering up uh, the fangs right there. The other thing, uh, like I said, you, you know, you always learn about spiders and spiders have web. Those, so they have these spinnerets, they're like these little spigots, and this is what produces, is another electron micrograph, and this is what produces that silk. And the silk, this is something I just learned recently, I did not realize, um, the silk is actually not sticky. There is a gland on the spider's body that then the spider uses to apply that, uh, makes this glue and applies that adhesive to the strands of silk to make them then sticky so they can snare their prey. So there are several glands that are attached to those spinnerets and these different glands produce slightly different types of uh, silk and then this aggregate, this is the gland that produces the uh, adhesive. And so they will employ different silks or different combinations of silk to make different uh, structures. Uh, and some spiders do very different things with their webs. Like I said, not all of them make a, um, a web. So like a, an orb weaver will have all these spokes and then they'll have these concentric circles. And you can see they're using two different uh, strand gland, two different glands to produce the, the silk they do. So it's one type of silk here. Uh, and it's also dragline silk. If you're not sure what a dragline is, if you've ever gone uh, on a tour somewhere where you're up really high and they give you a safety line, we got to have a harness and you attach in and then you're walking with the safety line that's what a drag line is to a spider um, like the little jumping spiders i showed you before they'll actually have a drag line behind them that they can use at any time even though they're not always necessarily climbing and so it's one type of silk for these cross lines and another type of silk for the the circles that they then fill in the uh, web with and the circles are what's actually sticky it's not these cross lines here uh, and the spider, of course, can also recognize what is and isn't sticky, and that's how they avoid it and get avoid getting stuck in their web. And if this all sounds like something that's not very important, this has been studied amazingly. These um, the genes, I feel like these are, if I remember correctly, these are the genes of these the two types of silk that make this drag line um, in their sequence. They have uh, an understanding of their their structure. This is a big deal because spider silk per pound is stronger than steel and it's more flexible. If I remember correctly, a spider can stretch that silk like to 135% without snapping it. So it gives them a little bouncy uh, and a little um, uh, a little stretchiness, which is really, really important. And so these um, materials are, have been studied and they're probably still being studied, constantly being studied, because if you could, uh, i trying to remember the word, I think, scale that up to make large human size materials that can be used to build structures or uh, bridges, things like that, out of this material, it would be revolutionary. But the scaling up is the problem. It works very well at this size for spiders, but it is yet to be scaled up to a worthwhile material that we can use for construction and other things like that. Um, so this silk that they are using, uh, they use this silk to produce webs. Oh, obviously, here's a an, an orb weaver. I think this is a red femurred spotted orb weaver. This is microthena. You can see that nice spiky abdomen or opisthosoma, um, which is essentially thought to make it distasteful because who wants to stick that in their mouth and get all their mouth punctured by those points? And so that is something that's not there for the uh, that's there to uh, essentially be a predator deterrence. These guys make really big web as well. I, you know, I keep saying these guys, and typically these are probably females. The larger 
females tend to be larger, and we'll talk more about that later as well. So a lot of times when you're seeing the spiders and the, the bigger spiders, what you're actually seeing are the females. The males are smaller and their webs are usually smaller too. Web building has been around for 100 million years, which is when this dates back to. This is the earliest discovery of a spider um, feeding on prey from its web. This is an amber. Um, so that spider probably didn't even get to eat what was going to be its last meal. Uh, and just this is an amazing image. And this is really uh, easy to find online if you want to read more about how they discovered this. But this is a hundred million year old fossilized uh, spider eating a, about to eat a wasp in amber. Uh, and you can see the remnants of its web right there. So besides using that, obviously they use the, uh, the silk to capture, you know, to build a web and capture their prey. Uh, and they also use that silk to wrap up their prey as well. Sometimes that keeps the prey from struggling to the point where they damage the web or, or hurt the spider. Uh, or they can save it for later, it makes it easier to digest. Um, so this is a common house spider. Uh, and actually, this is too the one that's getting eaten by this jumping spider. Another common house spider here with a Katie did. This common house spider up here has a cockroach with an Oothika, which is an egg case. So that's a big bonus meal for that spider there. This is a um, Argiope, A-R-G-I-O-P-E, one of the common garden spiders you'll see, um, which I think are really beautiful. But they, when I was a kid, this is I had a hard time with the were in the gardens around my aunt's houses all the time. And you can see this has got, if I remember correctly, this was a grasshopper that it wrapped up. Uh, and they can wrap, grab and wrap quickly. It's really impressive. And then this is a marbled orb weaver, which I believe is actually, let me move the box here that's telling me about my program, uh, is eating a, um, a couple of gnats that it caught in its uh, web as well. It's very small um, spider. And then, whoops. These are house spiders. The bummer with not being able to hear you guys is I always get a couple of oohs and ahs out of these pictures. Um, these are house spiders. This is, both of these are at Gulf Branch Nature Center. Every uh, August, we get these ringneck snakes that show up uh, in our um, basement. Uh, the ringneck snakes don't lay eggs, so the female finds a place to give a live birth as the eggs hatch inside, and then the, the youngsters come out. So we always end up finding a few of these in our uh, basement. And this one had actually gotten caught up in a spider web. And that spider had actually pierced the skin and begun feeding, uh, injecting the snake with some venom. Um, and the same here, you can see this is a, a, a young skink. It's still got the blue tail. It's wrapped up quite well by this house spider um, that's feeding on it. So these house spiders, you know, they don't have, they're not very picky. Whatever's in their web, if they can wrap it up and eat it, they will be more than happy to munch on it. Um, does, you know, I'm going to take a second here and pause. I think I'm halfway through or a little more than halfway through. Does anybody have any questions about anything I've asked? If you want to unmute for a second and ask me, otherwise I'll keep going and then I can check for questions again at the end. Okay. All right, I'll keep going. Um, and obviously they use the silk to produce their yeah. egg sac. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. We did have a question in the chat, sure. so let me just interject and I'll read it to you. Okay. How often spiders molt? Do spiders only see visible light, or can they also see UV or infrared? Ooh, two questions I don't have answers to. That's awesome. I got homework. Um, Wait, there's more, so I'll let you. There's two more. Okay. So I, uh, let so me go for those. Okay, let me try to address those. Um, spiders, I, you know, I don't know if they have a finite number of molts. They probably do, but the, the thing about being a spider is you don't have wings. Once you molt and have wings as an insect, that's it. That's your last molt, unless you're mayflies. They're the one, like I said, there's always an exception. Um, I don't know if spiders have a finite number of molts. I, I want to think some might uh, and, and, and others don't. I know like if you're keeping tarantulas, the males tend to be aggressive and they don't live very long where females tend to live much longer and they'll go through more molts but i don't know if that's um and that might be species specific too there might be a certain number of molts for one species versus another um but it's just how they get big and for uh, many of the spiders around here um it might be a finite number of molts because i don't know that they can all overwinter 
So by the end of the summer, you know, they're big enough that they've made it and they've laid eggs and they're not going to survive the winter. So that that could be a, a deal around here where in the tropics that wouldn't be as uh, big an issue. So I don't know about that. Uh, and as far as seeing infrared light. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Those large eyes and the reflective nature of them tend to have me think that they probably don't because they're using them for uh, visible light like we are. But uh, I'll have to check in on that. That's um, I want to make a note of those two questions uh, and see. Do you want to hit me with the other two real quick, Rachel? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so it says the other is what is it about the venom that is poisonous to us? And then the next one is when spiders take their webs down, what do they do with the silk? And then these are all from Betsy, who's asking the most excellent questions. They are very good questions. All right, I want to talk about the, the last one first with the silk. Um, orb weavers. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of them later because I got them at the end with the meet your neighbor segment. Um, orb weavers often make a new web every day. So what they'll actually do is consume the old web, uh, literally like go, 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 chew it up, eat the old web, uh, but then that helps um, conserve the silk so that they can then reuse it and process it. So they might eat the old web, but it'll be like an hour or two prior to when they start the web, so that gives their body time to process that silk and get it back to the spinneret so they can then make a new web. It also means you're very rarely going to see a messy orb weaver web. They don't tend to collect a lot of debris and dust because they'll do that every day. Whereas something like a um, a black widow, which is a cobweb spider, and that means they're just kind of like, here's a strand, here's a strand. And it, it, it doesn't always look like there's a, a pattern. It's not something as neat or as orderly or as, quote, beautiful as we might think of like an orb, we orb weaver with a spiral and all the spokes. Uh, and theirs often tend to um, accumulate more debris, but that's because they don't redo it every day like that. Um, but spiders will eat their old silk uh, and try and use it, conserve it, <coughs> excuse me, to make a new a uh, a new web because that is is one way of of um, reusing the material. Because think about it, it's a tiny little spider. It's got throwing all this um, web out there, and their body's making that. So if you can consume that, that's certainly going to help. Make that and then a uh, question about the venom it's um i think it's like part of it is like the reaction that we have to it is part of it's like an allergy obviously some people are much more uh, reactive to honeybee stings than the rest of us you know some people have an allergy to it and it, it can be life-threatening to get stung and have that that reaction to a honeybee sting where some of us are just like ow this hurts and i'm going to be grumpy about it for an hour and that's it Oh, and then it depends on what the venom attacks. So if the venom goes after certain types of cells that either we don't have or they don't have the proper receptor sites on them, that's going to change as well. So the venom, um, I'm going to cop out a little bit on this. The venom really comes down to chemistry. What does it react to? Um, and do we have the components in our tissues or in our blood or in our... Um, one of our bodily systems that react to that or not. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's the same with snakes. Some snakes are mildly venomous, um, but even if they could bite us, they're, and they're small, but even they could bite us, they wouldn't, because their venom is, again, directed more towards invertebrates, where if they bite us, it'd just be an irritation or maybe a slight swelling. And then, of course, there are venomous snakes, which are very much venomous um, to us. That is uh, unconcerned. Without going too far into a side note on snakes, we're starting to learn that certain snakes are venomous. It's just not medically serious to us, which goes back to that spider biting comments I talked about earlier, which is, you know, all spiders are venomous, which is not true of snakes, but not all spiders have a venom that can make us sick or, or really cause us pain or a lot of problems. Okay, all right, uh, I'm going to move on. If there's any more questions, I'll grab them at the end. Uh, thank you, Betsy. Those are great questions. Um, and again, as I mentioned, I was talking about spider silk. They can use it to build webs and trap and contain their prey. Uh, they can also use it to protect egg sacs. This is that common house spider again. Um, some spiders are, are, are pretty good parents. They'll stay near their egg sacs. Uh, so this is a, an egg sac and you can see all the spiderlings. This is not debris and dirt. This is actually a bunch of tiny little spiderlings emerging from there. Um, and some spiders will, they don't have webs and they don't have a place to hang their, their egg sacs, so they carry them with it. Uh, upper right is a thin-legged uh, wolf spider. It's a small group. These guys you see a lot here. They're really common. 
I used to see these at, a, at another place I worked there, tons of them in the little um, uh, garden. Uh, and we see them all the time. And this is a little egg sac. And it's holding its egg sac by its spinnerets. Okay. So that the, the text up here is about this wolf spider holding with spinnerets. This is a fishing spider, the six spotted fishing spider. And it's actually holding this large egg sac in its jaws. And then this is a long bodied um, cellar spider. Also has the eggs in its jaws. Now, they each do something slightly different when their eggs hatch. For wolf spiders, the spiderlings all gather on the female's abdomen. And if I remember correctly, it is, uh, they're there until their first molt. So they hang out with mom on her abdomen, they'll molt the next time, and then they're on their own. This is a fish, again, the fishing spider. When the egg mass, the egg sac is right here, when it's about ready to hatch and the spiderlings are ready to come out, she spins a nursery web and she belongs to the nursery web group. So this is what nursery web spiders do is they make these uh, webs for their for their spiders. And they'll hang out for a little bit and protect the spiders, the spiderlings. Um, but at some point, maybe after a couple of days, the, the female moves on and these youngsters are on their own. And what do they do next? Well, we're coming up to that. And then here's that um, long-bodied cellar spider. Uh, and they'll carry their spiderlings for about a week. And I think that's the time to the first molt uh, also. Ballooning. This is this is just my favorite thing. Um, and in fact, I'm going to try to show you all a video after the PowerPoint um, that I took earlier summer that I, some of you may not have seen. But what these spiders will do to disperse these young spiderlings is they'll find a, a perch that'll go up on top of a plant. This is a, a human-made object here. Um, you can see the scale. This is tiny. This is five millimeters. It's not a very big spider. But what the, the spiderling has done is it's he, um, let loose a drag line. Uh, and this drag line is meant to catch the wind. So um, as the wind picks up um, in the drag line here, you can see it's actually there's several strands there. As the wind picks up, this drag line will act as a parachute. Uh, and when the wind hits just right, and I don't know if there's a combination of the wind hitting just right or the spider losing its grip because it looks like it kind of was scuttling there to hold on a little bit. But as the wind picks up uh, and the spider lets go, off the spider goes. And this is how a lot of spiders actually uh, disperse um, because mommy might be really helpful at the beginning but at some point mommy's just a big predator so you don't want to stick around for too long so this is a chance for them to disperse and also um, get a head start somewhere else um, and I, I don't want to get too into this but there are tons of uh, there's a lot of information and a lot of information yet to learn about what happens to these spiders how long they're in the air column um, because there are some animals that do feed on ballooning spiders while they're still up in the air column, which seems to me to be such a specialized means of getting food. But at the same time, I think it could also be mean that there's more spiders in the air column at certain times than we realize. Um, but anyway, this is a, a, just a fantastic dispersal method. And I think it's really interesting. And I used to think it was just wolf spiders, but there are a lot of different spiders that, that uh, go ballooning. Um, I realize I'm running out of time here. We we'll go a little bit faster. Um, if you think you have arachnophobia, you think spiders really um, creep you out, try being a male spider. In many species, the male is significantly smaller than the female. This is sexual dimorphism, and it's, it, I, in some cases, I think I've read it's, it's even called extreme sexual dimorphism because the male is so much smaller. Um, some species, I think the male is 100 times smaller than the female, which is, um, to me, uh, really really small and it presents a problem if you're a male you've left your web to go find a female to mate with she might just be hungry and not for a nice meal at a restaurant either she might be hungry and she might eat you so some um some males will release pheromones uh in the hope of of calming the female some will do a courtship or a dance or or, or move in a certain way and see if the female's receptive and she might signal that she's just hungry, or she might signal she's receptive and still eat the male, um, but she might signal uh, the small male and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm receptive, let's, uh, you know, let's mate. Um, the male might bring something for the female to eat so that she doesn't eat the small male. Oh, I got a microphone on if somebody can make sure they mute that. Um, and the reason is the male has, uh, gets the sperm into the pedipalps. And when the male mates with the female, 
the receptacles for the sperm are on the underside of the female, which puts the male, in this case, uh, in the spider here, very close, even perilously close to the female's jaws and would make it very easier for the female to just be like, oh, I'm just going to eat you. Um, and so you can see in this picture, these are two wolf spiders. This is was taken in Europe. The male is actually kind of holding down. Okay. Uh, the male is actually holding down the female. Oh, boy. The male is actually holding down the female. Um, and you can see he's got his head away from her head. So his head's right here. Her head's down here. He's on her back. And he's reaching around the female and depositing the sperm with his pedipalp around her body uh, in, a, in a means of keeping away from her um, her jaws. Now, this is uh, one of my favorites. Rachel knows this spider, I think, fairly well. Uh, as she used to live there. Um, this is the Australian redback spider. You can see uh, it's pretty obvious what it's similar to from North American species. Um, it is often been called the Australian uh, black widow as well. And uh, it's in the same genus, Latrodectus, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can see this one's got a, uh, a small lizard uh, captured in there. Um, black widows, just like um, the other, earlier uh, orb weaver showed you, you can see here's the female. Here's the male, much smaller. If I'm this male, I don't know if I'm making a decision to come into this web looking for a female when she's already got an egg sac there. Maybe um, this is not the best time. Um, the black widows have that reputation for um, the female eating the male. Uh, I think that's, I think a lot of people understand that cultural reference. Um, what's interesting about the red back spider is the male will come in and instead of trying to bring something for her to eat, he will actually, if he can approach the female enough to start mating, he will insert his pedipalps to deposit the sperm and then he will somersault his body into her jaws and essentially she will eat him while he's mating with her, which is, I guess, uh, one way to do it. The, the the thing for the for the males is, I think they have an 11, 12, 13%, a really low rate of successfully finding a female. So when you find a female, you're all in, quite literally. It also means if she eats you, she now has energy. Because sometimes what will happen is a female spider will see the male and be like, oh, he's kind of cute, but he also looks delicious. And they'll eat the first meal, the male they find, and their body has energy to start producing um, the eggs and start making the, the, the materials they need to produce the eggs and the silk that they're going to need for all this. Uh, and so they've, <clears throat> excuse me, they have um, the energy they need now to go ahead and reproduce and they'll mate with the second male that comes along. Uh, in some spiders. So sometimes it's not always best to be first. Um, and the uh, the thought with the, the difference in the size of sexual dimorphism is that there's a selection process um, because the female uh, or the males select for the largest female they can find, which is dangerous, but it also means she's going to produce more eggs. So it means that when you mate, you're going to have more progeny. Uh, and so there's a, a selection pressure there for that. Uh, so anyways, I just like talking about this spider because it's just fascinating to me that it actually will jump into the female's jaws. In fact, I, I believe it's been observed where males have yanked other males out of the female's jaws, webbed them up so they can't get back in there, and then got themselves into that as well. Now, uh, females can also mate with several spiders, and what often happens is if you're the last one to mate, your sperm is preferentially used for the production of the eggs. So it isn't always bad to be uh, the late spider to the party if you are the last one. Uh, and some spiders will actually um, self-amputate their pedipalps to leave them into the female's uh, receptacles so that she can't accept sperm from a new spider. Um, and that is done as well. In fact, the um, the garden spider I showed you earlier, the Argeo, uh, I don't think we're going to see it again. Um, Sometimes in some of those species, A-R-G-I-O-P-E again is the genus. Um, in some Argeops, the males will actually um, die during copulation and their pedipalps are still inserted. And that is thought to be a way of uh, preventing the female from 
uh, mating again. Again, it's, it, the game with mating, the game with mating is all about making sure you get as many progeny out there and maximizing your genetic output. So for females, it's about diversifying and finding more than one partner. For males, it's about if you're only going to have one partner, you get um, you get that partner and then you don't let her mate with anybody else. So even though they're coming together and mating and producing young, they do have they, the two have very different can have very different agendas. So I did say I would try to introduce you to some of the spiders you'll find around here. These are two. I don't want to say this. These are two you could probably look up and see, depending on your house. Um, you could probably find in your house. The um, common house spider on the left and the long-bodied cellar spider on the right are both uh, non-native. They're actually introduced from other parts of the world. Um, but they also they have a cosmopolitan distribution, and they're mostly found around people. <clears throat> the cellar spider in particular cannot live outside of our dwellings when it gets too cold. Um, so they're pretty much an obligate to... Uh, I think it's called synanthrope, S-Y-N-A-N-T-H-R-O-P-E. And these are organisms that um, can only live uh, around or near humans. Uh, and so outside of its native range, it's definitely a synanthrope and it can only survive uh, where there are human dwellings. Um, and again, this is one from the Nature Center. You can see it's got the, the I think that's the mass of eggs in its jaws. Um, the other neat thing about this one, um, because they have been introduced in so many places around the world, um, the one nice thing about having them is they do eat larger spiders. They're actually um, very good at hunting and killing other spiders, including larger ones. And the redback spider, which can be um, medically very uh, serious, uh, as well as um, spiders like hobo spiders, which also have a uh, can be medically serious. This spider will actually eat them. So this is the spider you don't want to get out of your house because it'll help you get rid of the other spiders. Um, and so again, these are two spiders that you can definitely find in here. Oh, and it has also been called the daddy long legs. And so if you've ever heard daddy long legs has the most venom of any spider, and but you can't, but it can't bite your skin, so it could make you sick, but it could kill you if it could. Um, there's a long way to say that. Uh, there's a great Mythbusters, Mythbusters episode about this where they test this out. And these guys... If they're large enough, they can prick the skin, although whether they can actually inject venom, I, I don't know that that's really finalized, but their venom is not that potent, and it certainly wouldn't be that potent to us. Um, but they, again, are can be a beneficial spider to have in your house. Now, if you want to go outside of your house to find some other spiders, this is one of the nursery web spiders. It's very common, the American nursery web spider. Um, you can see this is a uh, mountain mint. The, the one on the right and the left here, these are trees. This guy was on a, a small shrub, so they're pretty common. You can pretty see them pretty well. Um, there's a general pattern here. These two lighter stripes with a darker stripe down the middle, <clears throat> excuse me, along the back of the spider. Um, but you can see the color can be variable. And some of these might be lighting conditions, but I feel like every time I see these, I often see them very different. This this spider, I just remember being really impressed with how orange it was, and it could also have been right after a molt. That you know, that's a possibility too. Um, but they tend to have a similar pattern, but the colors can be very, very variable uh, when you spot them. Uh, and again, this is in that nursery web family that produce that you know they carry the um, egg sac in their jaws and then uh, make a nursery web when they hatch. Speaking of which, uh, these are the fishing spiders, Dolomites. These are probably the these are the largest spiders you'll see in our area. Um, and so a lot of times people think they're wolf spiders because wolf spiders have that reputation. We don't have really large species of wolf spiders, not as large as some of these uh, fishing spiders. Uh, the one on the left is the six spotted fishing spider, which is Dolomites triton. I just think that's a, a great name. It's got that uh, mythology in it. Uh, the one in the middle is the white faced, white lipped. Oh, hey, hold on. Uh, the white face or white lipped fishing spider. And they're arboreal. They're the only one that lives in trees. And they're also the only one. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. They're not the only one that live in trees, but they are strictly arboreal. You're not going to find them anywhere else. They are the only fishing spider in North America that can have a, a gray tint to it. Uh, this is one of my uh, favorite finds. You can see that little white lip right there. That's how you, that's the, uh, the tell as far as identification for identifying it. Uh, and then this guy here, we have tons of these in our park. I've seen them in our basement, in our cabin, in the owl enclosure, I've seen them out by the pond. This is a dark fishing spider, and they're not uh, necessarily obligate 
um, as far as uh, fishing. These guys definitely live in uh, an underwater area. They're um, very good at hunting uh, small vertebrates and invertebrates that are uh, aquatic. Um, this uh, this guy will use uh, this species will use a lot of different habitats. You'll find them near uh, ponds, but you'll find them in forests. You'll find them in wooded areas uh, and, and lots of places where they cover. Uh, they're all they can get pretty large um, and they're they're beautiful. But uh, to me, they're they're one of the spiders that always startle me because I, I never notice them till they moved and it always catches me off guard. Another place you'll find them is in our um, firewood pile for campfires because I'm always find them in there and there are a lot of these in our uh pond the uh the six spotted fishing spider they can actually go underwater about six or seven inches which is impressive um this is one uh, i i don't always see the spider but i always see the web this is the bull bull and doily spider i think it's one of the cobweb spiders and you can see this kind of looks like a bull you got this curved bottom to the upper part of the web and then this flat little extra web beneath you can see it's similar here there's a flat web and a uh, second uh platform above it this little guy is the bull and doily spider again i say little guy it's, it's probably a gal uh probably the female uh but this is the bull and doily spider and i don't see the spider as much as i i usually see the um the web as a pretty common web you'll see a lot of this is one of our most common uh, orb weavers. You find these guys all the time. It's orchard orb weaver. This really um, nice shiny yellow and uh, yeah, silver white to yellow to with black stripes on the back. It's got green coloration. This is the underside of it here. That uh, orange yellow um, C shape there in a couple of spots. It's really really pretty spider. Uh, and these are pretty common. I, I think that if you went out in your yard or in any of our parks, this wouldn't be that hard to find. Uh, they seem to do really well here. This is the uh, orchard orb weaver. Oh, we have a few other or uh, orb weavers. This is a uh, spotted orb weaver. This is a red femurred spotted orb weaver here. This is the marbled orb weaver. These guys all make really good, um, really uh, nice webs. The ones I was talking about, the spokes and then the concentric circles. And they are, you know, the end of summer is usually a, um, a really good, uh, time for spiders because uh, a lot of them you know started out young or as eggs in the spring and so they're getting into maturity and they're getting larger and you see them to be more active uh, i know i'm almost out of time here Just hang with me i think i got one or two more slides um oh this might actually might be the last one and then the jumping spiders i think this is another one that we're really familiar with there's a lot of, of really cool species of jumping spiders this one here on the top uh, this is Platycryptus undatus. This is a tan jumping spider. It's very common. Uh, I've seen a lot of that one. This is a uh, golden jumping spider. And this one here is the sylvan jumping spider. And this is Metacerba taniola. I don't think it has a uh, common name. And then this is the uh, bronze jumping spider. There's a lot of, of really different ones. If you have a fear of spiders, I recommend jumping spiders. Because if you can get a tiny one, you go small. Don't 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 overdo it, but go small. You get one on your hand. One thing they'll do is they'll stop and they'll look at you. You know, if you move your hand, they'll turn and they'll look at you. Because again, they're, they're you're large and probably considered a threat, and so they're keeping an eye on you. But if they're small, they can't bite through your skin. Um, but they can be really. Uh, it's a safe way to have an interaction with a spider, and it's these are the spiders I used to get over my childhood fear because I I really had a really bad case of. of of arachnophobia as a kid. Um, I don't know if it was totally irrational, but it was, I, I can tell us some stories. So um, jumping spiders really helped me get that because as a naturalist, I don't want to have that kind of reaction to nature because that's not what I'm trying to promote. And uh, jumping spiders were the ones that really helped me get through that. I think this is, yeah, this was my last slide. Um, uh, the irony is as a kid, this was my favorite superhero, but um, not my favorite animal by a long shot. So I am excited that you're here with me tonight. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to take some questions if anybody has any. Um, so I just want to check in and see if anybody had any thoughts or any questions or if there's anything I could answer. And go ahead and unmike if you got a question. If too many people come in at one time, we'll try to, to manage it a little bit there. I, oh, go ahead. There's one. Okay. How, how can we do spiders? 
social. Okay, say that again because I, I miss it. What? How do spiders mate, or when do they mate? No, how frequently? Is it okay. Just once or like multiple times, or um, and then a second question is: Are they are spiders ever social, living in groups? Okay. Um, most spiders are, I would say, antisocial. They don't tend to live in groups. Um, and I'm sure there is a, I'm sure someone will find a, an exception for that. Um, they don't tend to be very social. Some have associations with other animals, but for the most part, they're they're solitary, um, except for uh, some of the females that take care of their young. Uh, and then how do they frequently do they mate? It depends. If you get eaten while you're mating or after you're mating, once. Uh, if you can get away, uh, great. There And again, there is thoughts that there is a disadvantage to walking away from mating. If you if you don't get eaten, maybe your mate does not have the, um, what you call it, the uh, energy to produce the the eggs and the, the, the silk for the, the egg sac that you need. Um, so there could be a, um, a lack of benefit there. Um, the females always want to mate more than once if they can. They want to diversify um, the genetic material for their young. Um, but I don't think, it's, it's, you know, around here, it might be once in a lifetime if the spiders don't live more than one season. Um, but if you're living longer than a year, you're, you're probably mating more than once. Um, but invertebrates tend not to be very long lived or really built for a, a, a durable long lifetime. You know, a couple, two or three years is a really long life, even for an invertebrate. Yeah, I'm sure that kind of answers our next question, which was how, what's a typical lifespan? And also um, what happens in the winter to spiders? Yeah, so what happens in, so, you know, around here where we have a winter and the further north you go, or, you know, in the Southern hemisphere, the further south you go, the longer you winter, the more severe your winter, the more likely that the spiders meet the end of their life at the end of the, that summer season. Um, insects can often go into winter in different um, stages of their life. They might overwinter as an egg or a larva or a pupa or adult or as a nymph. Um, but spiders, I, I don't think there's a lot that overwinter, but there, you know, there probably are adults that might overwinter. So maybe they have a, a I don't know, let's say, um, 14 or 16 month lifespan and they overwinter long enough to to lay eggs or, or produce an egg sac and lay eggs uh, and then die but I think a lot of them you know they lay eggs and that's it um, and it might be after mating there are some species where I believe the males don't eat they just they find a mate and that's it and so you know that one mating and they're done um, that's it and there could be multiple generations in the season as well it isn't just that they live that one season um, so again, I, I, it's it's tough because spiders is a really big group and there's a lot of different individuals. You know, there's the one that eats the plants. There are spiders that um, build webs. There are spiders that instead of building a web, they hang from a series of, of silk strands and they fashion what is essentially a bola. They have a long, long, skinny um, silk line. And at the end of that line, they have a big glob of, of, of sticky glue from that glue gland and what they do can't say that fast and what they do is when something flies by and they think it's a good um it's a, it's a good prey item they'll actually try to lasso it or stick it with this bola that they've done there are other spiders that instead of having a web they will hang from um a drag line and they have a web uh, stretched out between their legs and when something comes by they drop down and try to trap it almost like a basket um so there's like i it's I, this is a really big topic. I keep saying that. I keep doing these topics where I'm like, this is big. Um, it's a really big topic. And, and in this case, it's a really big group. And there's a lot of individual species that have do some slightly different things. But certainly around here, the, the lifespan for spiders, probably a year, maybe, maybe a year and a half. But it's probably a year and maybe less. Maybe it's a season. So I see there's, I don't see any other questions in the chat. There's a nice comment. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, does anybody else have a indoor, question? What about the indoor spiders? Can they last for a long time? That's a really good question. I don't know if they do. I, I, again, I think there's only so much. I think there's a finite amount of life that you can get out of that small body. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, they might last. They might last a little longer, but at some point, they're only going to live so long. So maybe two years. I don't know. 
Um, certainly they're sheltered, but if you've got spiders in your house and you got other critters too, so their their safety's not guaranteed that way either. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? It's great seeing everybody here. Well, the names, anyways. I don't see you all, but it's wonderful to have you all here in the chat. Oh, you know what? Since nobody's coming up with a question, I do. Let me see if I can get that video to play. I'm going to share my screen again. That video is really cool. What's that? I said, I've seen the video. It's cool. Oh, thank you. Um, nope, not the meeting options. Facebook, here we go. Um, so this is our pawn. Oh, we're going to mute me. We don't need to hear me. You can hear me now. Um, so this was a nursery web here. Uh, it's not, I hope this is coming through a little better than I'm seeing it. But um, you can see there's a web between these these two leaves here. And all those little things moving, those are all spiderlings. And I'm going to skip ahead to the good part here. We'll look for my finger. But these spiderlings are getting ready to disperse by ballooning, like I mentioned earlier. So you can see some of them are starting to drift off. And you can see the strands to the left. And in another couple of seconds here, I'll bring my, my big finger in to point out what I want you to see. And what will happen is an updraft will hit the plant then and, and, and hit it and watch the spiders go. Boop, 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 boop. Look at them go. That's ballooning. This was, I, 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 I know some people in my life have heard about this over and over and over again, so I apologize, but it's one of those things where you read about in books and you, you never know if you'll get to see it. Um, getting to see that in person was just really cool. And I just, I lucked into it because of the angle of the sun and, and the way I was taking the picture. So uh, it was pretty, it was pretty fun and exciting to see. So any other, it like something I was, there? how many of those uh, landed in the water? <laughs> I don't know. That's a really good question. Now, the funny thing about that is those are fishing spiders um, and fishing spiders like that species of fishing spider can shoot across the water like a water strider, which aren't spiders or are insects, uh, but they use the surface tension of the water. Um, and so, hold on, let me go back. Whoops, what's going on here? Let me close that and share for a second. Let me get back into my PowerPoint and see if I can find that picture again. And so here we go. Um, pulling up like a slideshow. Is everybody seeing that? I think I actually left. Try this again. Open the share tray. Open this. Is everybody seeing that? Can someone let me know they're seeing that? Oh, yep. Yeah, okay. I see it. So this guy right here, uh, this, uh, this gal, I should, well, you no, know, actually, I think this might be the male. This is the, the six spotted fishing spider. And if you can see, there's kind of a depression around the feet, you know, it's sitting there holding on to the plant and it's feeling for vibrations in the water. But if you came up and bumped that plant, it would scoot across the water, just like a water strider. So, um, that was a great question that whoever asked, uh, about, you know, how many of those spiders landed in the water, but if they landed in the water, they are equipped to move along and do what they need to do uh, without that being an issue. It would probably be not good for other spiders, but for these guys, they could actually land in the water and be okay. So hopefully some of them land in the water because we'll have more. It was a really good year. I saw three or four nursery webs um, in the pond this year. It was good stuff. And obviously I got to see that one, which is really neat. Well, it's it's 8.15. Uh, I want to thank you guys so much. i got to remember to stop recording, too. Um, but I want to thank you all uh, for, for joining me this evening. It's a lot of fun. I love doing these programs, so I hope to see you at the next one. Um, I think Maddie's actually in the next one on Monarchs in September. Um, but there'll be a few other programs. Oh, I have a – if any of you are interested in um, citizen science – Next Friday is the cricket crawl, and next Tuesday I will be doing a preparation program, uh, essentially learning what crickets were, and Katie did were listening for. Uh, and you can find that online and sign up or just email me and I'll get you a link or get you to that program. Uh, so you can go in your backyard and listen for some Katie did's and crickets and then contribute to a citizen science project. It's that easy. You walk outside, you listen, you go, hey, I heard those. And that's all you have to do. Uh, and they do this every year in August. It's a lot of fun. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, 
And again, it's, it's awesome seeing some of these names. I haven't seen some of these names in a while. Thanks, everybody. I uh, appreciate you joining me tonight. Uh, and have a wonderful night. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording and sign off. And uh, everybody take care.